Yeah, so um, thank you everyone uh, that is attending to my talk. Uh, today's topic, uh, what I'm trying to... Oh, it's not working. Okay, now it's working. Uh, today's objectives, or what I'm aiming uh, for this talk, is to first um, give some examples of ways organizations are currently addressing open source sustainability, uh, then deep dive more into the role of OSPOs uh, and how they are or how they can support open source sustainabilities. Uh, there are some community learnings and best practices. And finally, if we have time, spend some uh, moments for Q&A and maybe an open discussion. Where are your thoughts on this? So let's get started. So how organizations can address open source sustainability. I guess this is not a new topic for many of, of you here. There are many different ways. The most common ones that organizations usually start addressing open source sustainability that is not the, the main one. Oh. We will take care of it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it's providing funding. Uh, there are great initiatives that has been happening within organizations. For instance, um, I think it was last year, uh, Per was somewhere else, but um, they started the um, contributor, Spotify Contributors Force Fund to maintain independent projects. Uh, also, this comes from Indeed uh, Contributors Fund that they released many, many years ago. They, they already have a book uh, on investing in open source, in open source the first contributor fund uh, that is addressing all these challenges and how they implemented these contributor funds for organizations. And there are other great initiatives like the GitHub sponsors, and those are already being used by organizations such as Stripe. I, I think uh, Wolfgang also mentioned about the GitHub sponsor in his talk uh, with Mercedes. So there are many ways organizations can start providing funding, but that is not all. Um, they can also provide contributor contributions uh, coming from these employees or internal teams within the organizations and infrastructure to help those open source projects. A fun fact uh, that we uh, discovered in the last DOSPO survey for last year, 65% of organizations that frequently contributed code upstream uh, have formally structured an OSPO. We will uh, deep dive more into that. Uh, but another way that organizations can help out with this open source sustainability is integrating open source within the organizations and um, adopting open source best practices. This way they don't harm the environment, the open source ecosystems, and they know really how to contribute in a healthy way. Uh, one of the other insights we found out is the 80% of respondents uh, say their organization's program has a positive impact on software best practices uh, for those organizations that had the OSPO. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, there are different ways organizations can help open source sustainability. These are some examples, there are many more. But it's true that there is already, there is also a complex ecosystem happening and going on. It's not just a direct straight line. Uh, there are maintainers, contributors, independent projects, foundations, umbrella projects. So different open source actors, different ways to operate, different communications channels. And sometimes the message is not well transmitted. They even not um, the, even the organization doesn't get to hear the message from many of those uh, open source actors. So, if this works, if no. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> so, with the OSPO, um, the OSPO can be doing many different things, but at the end of the day, I like to call uh, to say that the OSPO cleans up the mess <laughs> in the organization and connects the dots, puts everything into order, uh, clean up the stuff, organize, and make sure that the message is transmitted in both ways. 
Um, so now we're going to get deep dive more into OSPOs and how they can be help to address this open source sustainability. But before continue, some important considerations. Um, no OSPOs are alike, so your OSPO is not my OSPO, and this is not like a, yeah, this is how you should be implemented an OSPO. Well, uh, we've seen OSPOs in the public sector works different than OSPO in the enterprises and, and so on. So don't take that as a standard way, but as a different practices to maybe get inspired and implement and adapt to your needs. Um, OSPOs can vary in sector, region, and organizational side, and some of them might call it differently. Like we have seen many of them call it open source office because program, well, it doesn't fit in their organizational values, and that's totally fine. And um, I would say that even in this um, conference, we've seen the term OSPO popping up uh, many times as an entity, uh, uh, as this design place is like a center of competency of open source operation. But in my today's talk, I want to give a different perspective and see if, if this clarifies a bit the things and uh, start thinking about OSPOS as a role. Because uh, there are many different roles uh, that can happen within the OSPO. It's more like an umbrella term. Um, and this can take these the res different responsibilities on implementing the strategies, the policies, the processes, um, and put this order uh, into all chaos on open source efforts. And not only that, but also making sure that the organization has the right tool and processes and education and knowledge uh, to start giving back to open source and beyond. And uh, the OSPO can take min many different, the OSPO roles can take many different um, skills or uh, responsibilities. The first one we can find is the enabler. So this is basically a uh, focus on educating uh, the different teams in the organization and uh, helping to navigate all the cultural process and tool changes that are required for the organizations to swift from the open source dynamic. Now, sometimes it's quite, might be quite hard for some organizations, more easy for others, uh, but at some point there's need some kind of um, uh, change in the mindset and uh, the OSPO, the different, there are some OSPO roles that can help on that. There's also the concealer. So this is more about, well, how can I, how can I? So um, where are the licensing issues? Uh, where are the open source trends? Uh, how should I be um, contributing code? Which open source projects? Which open source projects shouldn't, be, shouldn't I be uh, contributing? Uh, and so on. So it's more about um, giving advice to the organization on how to operate in open source. And of course, uh, all this cannot work without motivation and advocacy. So of course, we have the advocate role. So this uh, OSPO role is more focused on uh, motivating the different teams, not only the engineering team, on why open source matters, why it's important, and why it benefits and why they, so, they would like to, to contribute back to, to the different projects and communities, or even start ones. And the most important one uh, for, my, for this talk, at least, I will call it the environmentalist. So this is a role of more focus on addressing issues around open source security, like how to build more secure software, how to better maintain those open source projects, and how to address project health. So everything related with code review, with um, security management, um, with uh, long-term maintenance, um, and even funding or contributions. So these source provosts can ensure that uh, the project remains healthy and benefits both the organization, but also the open source community. 
Uh, and well, it's kind of clear that whether you have an OSPO or not, OSPO seems to be a good thing to have. But sometimes it's not just about that. I've heard a lot of people in the community uh, asking, well, yes, I understand the OSPO is important, <laughs> but where should I start? Is, is it like, uh, if, if I care about open source, should I just start the OSPO or, or what? Where do open source and OSPO converge? And to, to, to answer that, um, it's, uh, it, the organization needs a previous assessment and start asking third certain questions on, well, where are we doing with open source? What does open source mean to us? Because establishing the OSPO might not be the starting point for all the open source operations. Um, and I, I've seen also this um, path in, in all the different talks from, from different sources. But um, it's about first thinking of where is my organization at in the open source journey? Like, are we using? Are we actually contributing? Where and how are we contributing? Where and how are we using? Uh, the, where do we want to get? Even though we are just using, do we want? Are we planning to to have some kind of leadership, and and how are we gonna do that? So these kind of questions uh, can, when when answering these kind of questions, the organization should be assessing certain um, topics. The first one uh, should be culture. And we are saying this because we are saying OSPOS popping everywhere, but the organizations might be more mature in open source or less mature in open source. And this is really relies on the culture, uh, asking questions such as, well, at the first point, is there actually a culture of sharing and collaborating in my organization? My organi some organizations might have that, but others might don't. Um, and also, are already open source actors within the organizations working in open source? And how are they doing that? Or are they releasing open source? Are they don't? Uh, a great place to start might be uh, inner source commons and thinking about adopting inner source principles. Uh, they have a, um, a great source that is called the inner source patterns uh, to implement inner source principles uh, depending on different um, scenarios uh, within the organization. Also, another interesting topic will be to start asking about the level of knowledge and understanding on open source that is happening within the organization. So, uh, are they understanding the benefits and the risk of open source? Um, are, they, um, are they familiar with open source licensing? Are they familiar with, open, with, con with upstream contributions or not? Um, another thing about the usage of open source software or open works. Are they using open source in the organization? Where are they using open, open source or open works? And if those projects, if these uh, uses of open source, are there being implemented in critical um, wireframes or in critical workflows within the organizations or not? Another thing, tools and processes. Are there processes and tools in place to actually contribute uh, to open source? Do they, do they need to, to implement new ones to, to make that happen? And overall, it's all about addressing the gaps. The gaps that what the organization is on that starting point, and what do they need to start operating in open source dynamics in a good way. And once you have the organization uh, have Consider that and has been assessing this open source readiness. Um, they might be want to take the next level and say, well, let's, let's start an OSPO or let's start think about implementing open source program office roles uh, to start 
creating this public face that will organize all in one place and will direct to the right people and, trans and communicate uh, with the, with, uh, from, communicate the organi uh, sorry, no, <laughs> and try to um, communicate the organization's message and the open source ecosystem methods and the different open source players. Because yes, in the long term, um, it might be more powerful. Like when, when everything is organized, when there is processes and a strategy in place, it's less likely that the open source fails in the, in the, in the long term instead of doing open source ad hoc. But of course, we need to be very careful because um, even though OSPOs are a great uh, thing to implement, um, it's, it's, get, it's becoming very trendy. And with trendy things, what happens is that, well, many organizations might say, let's implement an OSPO because everyone is implementing an OSPO. And they are not thinking of, well, how should we be implemented the OSPO? So here are some basic anti-patterns of an OSPO. So for instance, establishing the OSPO without proper alignment with the organizational goals. Well, maybe it starts well, but it's, it probably will fail because the organization is not going to get value of OSPOs and of what they are doing. Maybe they don't know what they are doing. <laughs> Um, treating the OSPO as a separate silo. That's why this communication, internal communication, not, on, not only with the open source ecosystem, but also within the organization is important. Treating the OSPO as a legal or compliance function only. We get it. We know that there is a lot of dependencies and security risk, and this is really crucial. And many OSPOs was formed from the compliance um, section or area, but if you only get it stuck into that, the OSPO is not going to be evolving. It's also time to take some step back and think about the cultural, uh, the, the open source culture that is being infused in the organization and uh, the contributions and uh, how they are addressing open source sustainability if they want the OSPO to evolve. And last but not least, uh, viewing the OSPO as a one-size-fits-all solution. That uh, it's really related with the OSPO is not my OSPO. We cannot create a board template to build an OSPO uh, because every organization might be different. And the previous questions I was sharing, it's a clear example of, well, depending on how they respond, the OSPO is going to be operating different. So. No handling correctly open source in the organizations can harm the open source environment. And same supply to not handling correctly in OSPO. Um, so even though we don't have the answer for everything and there is no board template to build an OSPO, I wanted to also spend some time in this talk to share some community learnings and best practices that I've been hearing from the uh, Tudu community, that it's an OSPO community of practice. And um, they've been sharing this world through guides, um, through uh, webinars, uh, through uh, open source projects and more, um, and enhances this public knowledge and collaboration. And, how they started the OSPO, how they are operating in OSPO, what are the challenges they are facing. And they're sharing this everything in the public because it's important for all the OSPOs to learn and to also share uh, their, their specific scenarios, specific challenges. The first point is as I was mentioning, assess open source readiness. Before even starting the OSPO, uh, before thinking about anything else, well, do I really need the OSPO? What, what is my level of engagement with open source in general? Because maybe there might be small companies, they are not even barely using open source. And in that case, well, maybe the OSPO is not the solution. 
But if you start to assess these questions and you realize like, wow, I never imagined how much open source are we using, or even uh, I, I wasn't expected that amount of engagement or people so motivated to contribute, well, that, that might be another story. Uh, also, assess OSPO readiness. So it's not just about, well, uh, yeah, we know organization is really engaged in open source. How can we manage that in a, in a better way? So what are the challenges, the opportunities of implementing the OSPO? Because of course, OSPO, it's, they, they have roles. You need to hire uh, certain people. It's, it's going to cost you money. Um, and it's important that the organization is aware of that. And also, what do they need the OSPO to start uh, working? Uh, so what are the resources and the support that they need and make possible to, uh, to provide those? Uh, the third point, focus on transmission knowledge. Uh, this is uh, quite related with the not the OSPO working in a siloed team. So in the past years, I've seen many OSPOs that started, and then in one or two years, they died. And the main reason was because they, they were siloed. They, they were just like an entity, and they were not transmitting the value of open source in all the areas all of the organization. So there are different ways to transmit this value. So for instance, as an OSPO role, uh, you need to report to the supervisor. So what does my supervisor expect from the OSPO and from open source? What do they want? What do they want to hear? But also maybe I'm collaborating with other teams, with legal team, marketing team, engineering team. What does open source mean to them? How can I motivate them to contribute? Not only tech, uh, technical contributions, but not technical contributions. What do they, what does those teams find valuable? And maybe I'm the head of the OSPO and I need to manage other uh, people, like maybe within the team or as contractors, whatever. But what are they doing? What's my team doing? And how can I better manage that? And not, on, not only that, um, there's a, a, a fifth, uh, trans, fourth transmission knowledge that will be with this open source uh, ecosystem, with these open source players. Uh, and for that, uh, an important question might be, well, what is the method of integration? Like, how, how can I build these communications channels? How can I hear their feedback? And how can I transmit the feedback from my organization? Uh, and I think inclusive knowledge transmission is key. And there are different ways of doing that. Um, most of that. Uh, can come in the way of measuring, because data, it's a global language. I will explain in my next slide. Uh, but since data is a global language, it can speak different uh, languages within the organization and outside. So through measuring, the OSPO and the different OSPO roles uh, can help to transmit this uh, knowledge and this value. Uh, this is not mine. <laughs> this comes from one of the brainstorm ideas uh, I, we did in, in another group to work on an OSPO book project. And the people can, of course, uh, take a look at that. And it was one of the uh, email threads that happened uh, when we were discussing about this topic on the transmission knowledge, in case you are interested. And as I was saying, uh, data is a global language. So in order to have this transmission of knowledge, it might help to start thinking on including data science roles or uh, data analysis roles in, within the OSPO. Um, this is a topic that uh, we talk about in the last Chaos OSPO working group, metrics working group. And I thought it was really interesting, like how some OSPOs were already starting to have um, 
certain roles are related to uh, think of data hygiene, open source analysis, or open source data engineering to put order into all this mess. And the last one, um, it's important to look at sustainability from both angles. So we've been, think we, uh, we've been discussing a lot on how OSPO roles can address open source sustainability to um, help open source communities as well as the organizations. So that is a really important part. But also you need to think of how to make OSP sustainable it itself or OSP role sustainable in itself within the organization. So this open source public uh, person or group of people doesn't die in the long term. And to end up with, here are some takeaways from my talk. The first one, um, it's, it's basically more a question. So uh, do open source actors know how to contact in your organization? If you ask this question, do you know that? Who is the, this public person? Well, OSPOs are usually responsible of that, of being this public person where uh, the open source ecosystem can contact them and also the organizations to ask them for certain advice on open source. Also, think about fostering self-discovery. And by self-discovery, I'm not meaning on the person, but in the organization. It's important to understand how the organization operates, how the, op the organization is addressing open source, what does open source mean for the organization. And if they are completely lost on that, how can I educate them uh, to understand open source and start um, integrating open source in their uh, in their day to day activities? And finally, um, think about open source transmission knowledge because it's not. It, of course, it's important to think about how to structure the OSPO, where the OSPO should be reporting to, and so on. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you want to maintain open source in the organization, it's more about how this person or this group of people can transmit the value of open source in, you know, uh, across different uh, people that might be um, tech, or they might not be tech, and they might be speaking different language, and they might be having different motivators. So it's a, it's a great responsibility. <laughs> and that's all. So if you want to learn more of these community learnings that I've been sharing, uh, these are some from the Tudor group. There are many other communities that, of course, are sharing great value on um, how to contribute to open source projects, upstream contributions, but uh, well, this is what I've involved at, so that's why I'm sharing uh, the to-do guides on how to create an open source program and so on. There is an OSPO 101 free course to get in a starting uh, with an OSPO. Uh, there is a white paper on deep dive into open source program offices that explains well the different structures of an OSPO, more, more focused on a corporate perspective, but well, can help to, uh, to get inspired uh, in other sectors. And also we have OSPOlogy. Um, it's not just um, webinars things, but we try to invite uh, people from, uh, that are helping the OSPO community uh, to talk about a specific topics around uh, open source program offices, uh, sustainability, how they are being structured, uh, initiatives they are developing and so on. And uh, we are having these panel discussions every month. And um, we are also having working groups. Uh, right now, the active working groups are divided into uh, a working group that is working on the next OSPO guide, the uh, OSPO guide that is based on open source, employee open source engagement, like how employees can contribute in a healthy way to open source projects. There's also another working group on education 
to extend this OSPO 101 free course. And there is uh, the OSPO metrics uh, working group that is under CHAOS, uh, that is another open source project focused on community health analytics. Um, that is called the OSPO metrics working group. And well, if you scan that, uh, it, it's just um, a link to the, uh, to the Slack channel because everyone is welcome and you can join the community and say hi. So saying that, uh, just a short story about myself. I'm Ana Jimenez Santa Maria. I was uh, formerly working at Viterja, that is a software development analytics firm. And there I, I gained a lot of knowledge on working with OSPOs and inner source organizations uh, from the metrics side and uh, how to address value and, um, and, and measure open source health uh, of the projects. Uh, I'm currently the OSPO program manager at Tudu Group that it's a group of practitioners advocating and educating uh, with, uh, through OSPOs uh, across organizations. Um, I, three years ago is now, uh, I, I always say I recently finished my master's in data science, but no, it's been now three years. Uh, and I'm involved in other open source communities such as, well, Ospology, uh, Chaos, Inner Source Commons, DevRel Collective, and Open Chain. And that is my first one in case you want to follow me. And if we have time that I don't know, uh, yeah. So, we do have time, so I would love to hear some any questions you have, and also bring an open discussion on whatever you you want to address during this uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>